behind entirely and, and, and typeset the, the manuscript. Um, so uh, the place to buy the book uh, is Love Books, uh, which is a bookshop in Johannesburg. Uh, it's at the, for those of you that don't know, it's, it, it's at the Bamboo Center on Rustenburg Road uh, in Melville, in Joburg. It can also be um, um, ordered uh, online and posted within South Africa. I forgot to ask Judy for the details of the website or uh, uh, the contact, but maybe uh, Judy, when you get a chance later, uh, you can put those details in the in the chat for everyone to see. And uh, for those based in North America, Europe and other countries uh, that have Amazon and where Amazon delivers, um, the book can also be uh, purchased on Amazon. Uh, the South African uh, published version is much cheaper, I'm pleased to say, than the Amazon one. Um, but uh, I encourage everyone to buy uh, the book. Um, the book, of course, is uh, the story in the book is Judy's story, um, and it's told through uh, from her own perspective, but the story is inseparable from uh, that of the movements that she participated in throughout her life from the Medu Art Ensemble at the, at the height of the anti-apartheid struggle in Botswana to uh, the One in Nine campaign today. And so as an historian, I uh, hope that the book um, will inspire others that like Judy um, have participated in uh, what was uh, a, a vibrant um, cultural movement that was aligned to Southern African liberation struggles uh, to also write their own stories. And, um, and I hope that the book will also give some impetus to the need to uh, archive and record this history uh, for new generations of uh, um, art makers and, and activists. Um, we are very fortunate to have with us tonight Mandla Langa and Makosa Zana Baba um, to join Judy in the discussion. Uh, both Mandla and Kosi are award-winning writers and fellow travelers in the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, the format of the event uh, will be the following. So um, Judy will uh, give a brief introduction of the book. And after that, I'll ask Mandla and Kosi to uh, give uh, their input. And they'll each have about 10 minutes. And after that, we'll open it. Oh, no, after that, I'll give Judy a chance to respond to these initial comments. And, and after that, we can open it up to the to the audience. Um, if you want to participate in the Q&A later, please um, uh, unmute yourself and start your video. Uh, but um, until then, I suppose it would be easier if everybody who is not speaking um, uh, stops the video and is muted. Um, I wanted to uh, tell everyone, oh, also uh, you'll be able to um, send, uh, come with a lot of participants, which is great to hear, but it may mean that we won't get a chance to get um, everybody's comments or questions. So you, uh, please feel free uh, to put those in the chat um, so that we have a record of those. And, um, also uh, just letting everyone know that the meeting is being recorded and it is being live streamed um, on through the History Workshops Facebook page. And we will uh, make a recording available um, on YouTube through the History Workshops YouTube channel at a later stage. I think this is it uh, from me. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Judy to speak next, if you're ready, Judy. Thanks very much. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. And um, greetings to everybody. It's wonderful to see you. 
many people I haven't seen for a long, long time. It's, it's just great that you're able to make it. Um, so colleagues, family, comrades, fellow panelists, thank you for being here. Um, I said I was going to talk about why this particular book. Um, and to do that, I'm going to do the classic thing at a book launch, which was start by reading from the introduction to the book itself. The book actually starts with three quotes and they're all relevant to this. So I'm going to, the first one was from Tommy Minelli, who was a graphic artist with Meru and um, the ANC and MK, in fact, and uh, who was killed by the SADF in 1985 in the Hepatoli Lake. Tommy wrote, <clears throat> whatever artistic indulgence we engage ourselves in, we must not be blind to the river of life within and around us, that social stream from which art feeds and is nourished the community. And that to me is point one of this book. Um, point two, the personal one, there's a quote from Audre Lorde, also in the introduction. Audre Lorde, for, I'm sure you all know, is a feminist, American feminist writer and poet. But she writes, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be quenched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive, which I think is a good reason to write an autobiography. Um, lastly, the third quote um, I have at the introduction <laughs> is self-indulgent. It was a quote from my own, bio, my own diary from the 10th of April, 1994 in the run up to the elections. Um, and it says, like so many other women, I weave stories about my life. I am the hero and actually, courageous, loving, ecstatic, hurt, and then courageous again. And sometimes life tries to live up to the stories. And then again, it turns around and, and sticks its tongue out. You are never who you think you are. Ha ha ha. Anyways. So in many ways, writing this book was another attempt to do what I try to do in most of my artwork, which is to find the ties between what happened to me or those particular and maybe peculiar things that I had to go through, both personal and mostly personal and individual, with the far larger pressures and structures, the political, the social, and the economic structures that affect all of us, that shape our communities, societies, history, and even our humanity. The prime example in the book and in my life, as far as I'm concerned, and the key part of my story is talking about the group called Medu Art Ensemble, which I was privileged or maybe blessed to be part of between 1980 and 1985. If anyone here does not know what Medu was, uh, one line version is that Medu was a collective of art makers in Haparone, Botswana formed by, by a core of cultural workers who went into exile from South Africa in the late 1970s with the intent of making art in all the disciplines that spoke for and of the liberation struggle in South Africa. Um, people have talked about Robben Island being a university for political studies. Meru was undoubtedly my higher education in arts and culture. Tommy, again, once said about Meru, it was in Meru that the artist does things consciously. The whole little ensemble is a workshop, a classroom, a jungle through which people must carve out a home. And for me, it became all of those things, a place to do things consciously, a workshop, a jungle, and yes, a home. Meru shaped my art and my politics and my understanding. It taught me what you imagine and dream inside your own head is only one small part of making arts and culture. Those dreams and imaginations come from the people around you, and they're carved out of experience and events and language and environments. And then when you make the art, you take those things you have in your head and you put them back in the community around you. And hopefully, if you make it, if what you make is worthwhile, that becomes part of what other people will build their own visions and their own hopes and their own ideas from. 
And of course, Meru also taught me that art is a cult, and that culture is a weapon of struggle. After university in Meru, I spent the 1980s trying to put theory about art of liberation struggle into practice. And then after 1990, seeking how those principles might apply in a post-apartheid South Africa. Anyways, so one of the key lessons from what I learned from Meru is that all of our stories are critical to understanding where we are today. Each of us, whether we consider ourselves artists or cultural workers or mothers or freedom fighters, has a unique story to tell. And these stories, especially those that have been hidden and ignored and suppressed, are able to challenge the hegemonic narrative of those who have ruled, the colonialist, imperialist, exploiters, and oppressors. These stories need to be recorded, and more, they need to be made public because part of our communities are education, and they must become part of our communities, our education, and our understanding as we go forward. Um, we all know today. <laughs> that there are everything from tweets and PhD theses that claim fake histories and make fake news, that distort and mangle and tell straight blue lies about what we did and why we did it. These fake histories cannot be allowed to hold the stage, not in our names, and especially not in the names of those who died fighting for their beliefs and visions. Many of those who from the 60s have not, many of those from the 60s have not survived to tell these stories. And we also need to note here the calamity, calamity that we have just experienced with the burning down of the African Studies Library at UCT. And in the chat beforehand, we're still waiting to hear just what was lost. But that reminds us that we cannot, absolutely cannot forget that recording these stories must be accompanied by preserving the archive and embedding that knowledge in people's awareness. Um, this is a task we cannot possibly fail that. In this context, by the way, I want to thank History Fitz History Workshop for organizing this panel. And also I want to mention a project that this History Workshop along with South African History Archive Saha and Bits Historical Papers are starting now, which is to collect and put into the public domain and on the internet, the history and archives of the Meru Art Ensemble. So I'll finish now. <laughs> so this book is then dedicated to those who created and believed in this vision and this hope, and who were part of the praxis of art making and struggle that made this hope and vision part of our lives. I personally have two hopes for this book. One is that it will push others to write their own versions of what happens. And this is whether you agree with me about my version or not, that's fine. We need everything. We need these histories as part of our collective and part of our pu public record. My second hope is that some of you who are still growing up now after these events have happened, whether you are students today, whether you are grandchildren, or I include those who are still yet to be born, may find in our struggles and our experiences, our victories and defeats, some kind of encouragement to create your own visions and struggles. Okay. So I'd like to say thank you again to all of you. And I'm really looking forward to what my panel has to say. Um, I think it's great that they're here and able to talk on this. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Judy. Sorry, I'm a bit slow with the technology. <laughs> um, thanks very much. Um, I think we'll um, uh, move straight uh, to uh, Mandla Langa's input. Um, as all of you, I'm sure, know, uh, Mandla Langa is a writer. He's written numerous uh, uh, books. Uh, uh, the, the last novel he published is, um, uh, uh, sorry, Mandla, I'm terrible. Uh, um, Please help me. Yeah. Your last novel. My last novel was um, The Texture of Shadows. The Texture of Shadows. I'm very sorry, Mandela. No, no, I no, think 
I think I'm more nervous than Judy <laughs> and it's not even my book. <laughs> um, and uh, he's also uh, co-authored with Nelson Mandela, uh, Dare Not Linger, about uh, his uh, years um, as president of South Africa. Um, Mandela, uh, over to you. You've got about 10 minutes and then uh, we'll move on to Kosi. No, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm just glad to be, to see so many faces from the past. These artists, these uh, writers, and one or two lapsed uh, terrorists. First of all, I'd like to thank the Vets History Workshop and Love Books for hosting this webinar launch of Judy's Judy Sidesman autobiography, which is titled Drawn Lines. I would also like to thank Ariana uh, for inviting Akosazana Klava and I to share our thoughts and insights about the book. <clears throat> but much more importantly, I would like to congratulate Judy on her courageous autobiography. Uh, I think it's a, a treasury that all of us really are going to uh, cherish for a long, long time to come. Today, which is the 21st of uh, April, it's less than a week before the 28th anniversary of Freedom Day which is also more than 36 years since 14 June 1985, which Judy has spoken about, when the SADF Special Forces, together with members of the security branch, launched a cross-border raid against ANC targets in Khaborone, Botswana. These were 12 people were killed and six wounded in the operation. The numbers might vary. Among those killed were, were eight South Africans, Botswana nationals, I think there was a Somali and a Lesotho citizen. Among the dead was an artist of consummate skill, Tami Miele, who worked with Judy in Medu Art Ensemble. In talking about Judy and her work, one is inescapably reminded of an observation made by the eminent Black American author James Baldwin in his essay, The Artist's Struggle for Integrity. He writes, <clears throat> I want to suggest two propositions. The first one is that the poets, by which I mean all artists, are finally the only people who know the truth about us. Soldiers don't, statesmen don't, priests don't, union leaders don't, only poets. That's my first proposition. We know about the Oedipus complex, not because of Freud, but because of a poet who lived in Greece thousands of years ago. Baldwin second proposition is a declaration that something is awful is happening to a civilization when it ceases to produce poets. And even more crucially, when it ceases in any way whatsoever to believe in the report that only the poets can make, unquote. Judy tells a life story in her own words, quote and unquote, as an act of affirmation <clears throat> to affirm the hope and joy of humanism, which are inextricably linked to her art. I would like to settle Judy with another responsibility, which she has taken upon herself, possibly not meaning for that to be her life's preoccupation and that is the responsibility, the mantle of witness. 
a witness is not only the one who sees for the sightless and hears for the ones struck dumb by force and circumstance, but the witness chronicles a transition, progress or setback, a journey and retains in her personal archive nuggets that sustain generations when the sounds of war have abated and the storm has passed. Yesterday, I sat in front of the television set waiting for the verdict on the white cop, Derek Chauvin, who met at George Floyd almost a year ago in the US. When the jury turned in the verdict of guilt on all charges, <clears throat> I felt especially moved, not so much by the, real, the realization that justice will finally be served because there's no such a thing, but because I remembered the, se the self-effacing 17-year-old Danella Fraser, who kept her cell phone camera trained on the cop as his knee squeezed the life out of the helpless black man. The prosecution admits that its case would have been difficult without the young woman's evidence. She bore witness and changed the trajectory of history. Judy has borne witness. She embodied inter internationalism, a concept that's become almost taboo in our present age where nativism and xenophobia are the order of the day. I can imagine her parents and the children's bewilderment leaving snowy Wisconsin to tropical Ghana and from there to the few countries on the African continent, Botswana, where Judy was part of the underground and participated in the movement to make the arts relevant to the lived experience of the community. There's a quote from Jacob Martins who exemplifies the work that Judy set out to do. Quote, as politics must teach people the ways and give them the means to take control over their own lives, art must teach people in the most vivid and imaginative ways possible, how to take control over their own experiences and observations, how to link these with the struggle for liberation and a just society free of race, class, and exploitation. It is Judy's courage, however, that makes the book at once readable and searing in its unwavering, unwavering gaze on her own life and the lives of others. Here she doesn't spare herself, speaking candidly about her HIV status. And in one of the most revealing sections, the minefield of relationships during days and nights of love and war in the underground. She speaks of betrayals, suspicions, and of her loves and her losses. <clears throat> One of the people she writes about whom I met in Lusaga is Serge. It was clear to all of us who watched this relationship in action that Judy was Serge's destination in life. This was a larger than life comrade a real soldier of Mkondo Wesizwe, and not one of those Essats wannabe soldiers in pep store camouflage uniforms. As a writer myself, I would have loved to write Sergi's story because it is one that needs writing in this dangerous time of revisionism. The ANC then, under President Oliver Tambo, was the ANC were most likely fated never to see again. This was when people sacrificed and also loved desperately. 
I remember Serge commenting on traveling and carrying weapons along the dangerous trails of Mozambique. He spoke of Nampula and this characterization of that stretch has stayed with me through time. He said, quote, that place is so dangerous that I would, I would refuse an order to go there now, even if they would arm me with a nuclear weapon, unquote. Judy's book reinvites us to do what Henry Giraud calls thinking dangerously in the age of normalized ignorance. It calls upon, upon us to reclaim our humanity and the humanity of all those who have gone before us and those values that have become non-functional and passe in the land of celebrity worship and crass consumerism. It enjoins us to go back to the archives of our lives and bear witness, not so much to wallow in the glories of the past as to recalibrate our focus on how we wish to shape the future. The future does not belong to us, this future, but to the coming generations. Let a new earth rise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mandla. Um, for always uh, digging deep into the archives of our lives and um, using those to, um, to, to shine light on uh, events that are, are happening today. Um, thanks also for that tribute of uh, Serge uh, that I uh, would love to know more about. Uh, uh, one of my favorite drawings of Judy's is uh, uh, the comrade Serge uh, uh, a painting uh, of him reading a copy of the African Communist. Um, anyway, we'll move on um, to uh, Mako Sazana Aba. Uh, Kosi, are you, um, are you there? Kosi uh, yeah. is uh, uh, also a writer, has published uh, poetry, short stories, uh, um, and uh, uh, most lately, a, an edited book, Our Words, Our Worlds, uh, which has won an award at the National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences um, uh, Award uh, recently. Congratulations, uh, Kosi. Um, so uh, over to you, and then uh, we'll go back to Judy. Thank you, Ariana, and a good evening, afternoon, morning, depending on wherever you are, good whatever, everybody. <laughs> and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to participate at this launch. I first read Judy's book about two years ago when she and I were at a colloquium at Stellenbosch University. She carried her book and we started talking about it. And I think my greatest surprise at that point was uh, I had expected a book by an artist to be a lot more about art. And so I was very excited to see so much content on stories and history and family and all of that. So congratulations again, Judy. I enjoyed reading the book then and I had to reread it now in order to prepare for this. So for people who haven't read the book, I want to summarize it in this way, that it is a book that combines her personal life, starting from childhood in the USA, moving to Ghana, being at a boarding school as one of three white students and a campus that had 800 students, her parents' activism and the work in Ghana, moving back to the USA where she completed her education and then life back in the continent, in Swaziland, Zambia, Botswana, her marriage, her own family, her husband, her daughters, and then her art and her contribution to the movement. And what was very impressive for me was how all of these things just melt into each other with a lot of ease. As you page through, you see how stories connect seamlessly 
There is poetry, there is artwork, there's posters, there's diary entries, quotable quotes, drawings, short stories, photographs, everything. And each page looks different. You can tell this is a book that was designed by an artist, but you, you move easily through the book. And I really, really enjoyed that. And what the book does is to capture the unity from which Judy speaks. And it's for me really a great book. And I was quite drawn to the title, Drawn Lines. And at that superficial level, a book by an, et, an artist, if it's called Drawn Lines, it makes a lot of sense. That's what artists do. They draw a lot of lines and then they create beauty from that. But the title for me was also more about more than that. It was about more than art because it's about our lives. We exist within lines that are drawn first and foremost by our contexts, whether it's social, political, economic contexts. And then we make choices within those broader lines. We then actively draw our own lines as we make those choices. If you decide to be an artist, an academic, a writer, a sports person, you're drawing lines for your life. So I really enjoyed a title that is so, that sounds simple, yet it's so profound. A title that is so embracing, all embracing in its simplicity. It was really, it is an elegant title. But I must say that it wasn't until I was on page 163 that I thought, hmm, maybe this title could have had some additional spice. It is on this page that Judy writes about her relationship with Tenji Wooti. Sorry, was that towards me? No, oh, sorry, carry okay. on. <laughs> okay. So on page 163, Judy writes about her relationship with Tenzi Wim Tinso. And she details how she and Tenji Wei would on some days book into a high class spa and play Scrabble in the sauna because, and I quote, nobody, we figured, would look for an underground woman combatant playing Scrabble in a sauna, close quotes. It was at this point that I thought maybe the title could have been Drawn Lines and Playing Scrabble, Scrabble in a Sauna. And the reason I was thinking that, of course I'm joking, but it, was, it had to do with something quite serious because what being a combatant in the underground meant that you had to find ways of being seen to be just ordinary. So if you're just playing Scrabble in a sauna, you're just ordinary women. Nobody's gonna be saying, you know, nobody's gonna be thinking certain things about you. And the, it resonated with me, this playing Scrabble in a sauna because my activism started in South Africa. And in no time you learn to find ways of your playing Scrabble in the sauna equivalent because that was about safety that was about security, that was about responsibility, and that was about your credibility as an activist. So Judy has spoken about the quotes that she uses in the introduction of the book. I wanted to revisit the one that says, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. I remember talking to Judy at Stellenbosch and she told me exactly using that reason that as women, it is very easy to be defined by others. And sometimes we are eaten alive. Judy gives a few examples of this particular condition. One condition is that, what one example rather is how she used to experience people just assuming that her, the, her artworks were not hers, that Tamimiele had drawn those artworks. 
She gives another example of how her mother's economics theory informed Kwame Nkrumah's uh, writings. There's another example of how her mother's senior professor published conclusions of her work in his name and merely called her a research assistant. I'm sure that a lot of women who are on this forum tonight have their own personal examples. And many of us know what it feels like to have your work appropriated, ignored, trivialized, marginalized. And so to me, this is a word to say, really, thank you for doing the work, Judy, because it speaks to what we need to do as women in order to fight erasure. So I'd like to then talk about maybe three points that I would like to invite Judy to respond to. The first one being the Media Arts Assemble in Botswana. In the book, Judy lists names of people who were part of the visual arts unit and the cultural activists. And of course, my default is to start counting how many women's names appear on this list. Yes, they are. And clearly they're in the minority. And Judy speaks a bit about gender within me do. But what I'd like to invite her in particular, in particular to speak about today is about how exactly being in the minority within an arts movement of a liberation movement manifested itself. How do they talk about it as women or did they not? And just give us a bit more detail about what that meant because I think there's a general populist view about how artists are more liberal, they're more this, they're more that. And so, to see that section in the book, Gender in Nidu, made me even more curious. So I'd like to invite Judy when she comes back to speak to give us a bit more texture about what that meant. And the second issue I'd like to engage Judy on is about what I'm calling the private life under the umbrella of a public disaster. And in particular here, I want to refer to how she speaks in the book about her daughter, Annie, being good friends with Catherine Spoon, who later died with her mother, Jenny, in Angola. How she speaks about how she and the husband discussed what it meant for their daughter to be friends with this person who was clearly known to be targeted by apartheid. Soon after that, Joe Gabi is murdered in Harare, and June, Judy tells us about how she heard about this as she was visiting her parents in Harare. And of course, Tammy Miele dies in, with many others in 1985. And earlier in the book, Judy had written about how when she moved into her own space with the daughters, there was a bedroom that uh, Tammy could have used, but in conversation, it became clear that that would become too much of a big risk. So the point I'm trying to make is that it is very easy when we have conversations about these big public events and public disasters to forget about the smaller stories of the person who was involved and their engagement in it and how they experienced those moments. In the book, there's a drawing of Annie who talks about who rewrites for herself what her mother had told her about how her friend had died. And there's a moment, there's a moment there when Judy talks about how Wally looked at that writing and was mute. So I'd like to invite Judy to share a little bit about what these big moments meant in her life, in her private life and how she engaged with them. And then lastly, of course, would be Julie's professional work as an artist. And here, I'd just like to invite you, Judy, to just talk, share whatever you'd like to share, the ups, the downs, the growth points, whatever you'd like to share in this forum, because I think for people like myself, 
I knew that art was important. I knew writing was important. I knew poetry was important, but I just wanted to fight. So I was gonna do all the other things much later in my life. Of course, I was reading people and I was trying to understand art. So I'm, I'm keen to understand from your perspective as an artist, what it meant for your profession to be existing within these drawn lines of uh, broader activism in communities that were all active and fighting a good fight. So in ending, I just want to say that I was, <laughs> I was quite surprised actually to see so many names of people that I knew, that I know and I knew in different contexts. For instance, Jacobi Ben Martins used to run an underground library at Edendale Lay a Communical Center in Peter Maritzburg. And that is a library that changed my life. I was already a great committed reader, but in that library, I found bent books, I found cassettes, I could listen to poetry from the US, I could listen, that was the first time I listened to the speech by Martin Luther King, I have a dream. And that library was run by Ben Kobe Martins, it transformed my consciousness and made me feel like I belonged to the world because I think what was powerful about apartheid in my time, time before television, time where media was, was sanctioned was that you felt like you were in this small little country that didn't like black people, end of the story. The extent to which racism was an international factor was not, available for us to access. The extent to which other people were fighting these struggles was not available. So that library in my, in my head, I associate with my transformation, my transforming um, consciousness. And whenever I went to it, there was only one person, Ben Dikobe Martins, nobody else. And it looked kind of normal as you approached it. But the books that were there and the cassettes that were there were life-changing. You also write a short story, Judy, in the book, which mentions Ongoya University. I was there on that 29th October, 1983. It was a Saturday morning. By the end of the day, four students had died, killed, by black men. Four black students had died in the hands of crowds of black men. So this book tells our stories, whichever way you're coming from. This book for me reveals our entangled networks of connection. So thank you very much, Judy. I will end there. Thank you very much, Kosi, um, for raising these important points, particularly around um, how gender uh, shaped, well, in Judy's story, her participation in the cultural movement um, of uh, the liberation struggle and, and the liberation struggle itself. But I'll, I'll give Judy a chance to respond to both Mandla and Kosi's um, inputs, and then um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can open up to the audience. Okay. Um, <laughs> two. <laughs> I'll try not to burst into tears. Um, both, of, both of you, thank you so much for, for what you said about the book, and I, I really appreciate it. I, I, feel like maybe it, it's getting to where I would. Um, Mindless comments on search, what can I say? Um, I'd like to, I would like to say, as with Mandela, I've always felt that Serge's story needs to be written. I didn't feel I could do it. I, I'm too biased in too many ways. Um, and I hope that somebody someday will, decide that that is a story that has to be put together. Um, even if we just collect the information and don't write it up, 
it should be done now. Um, the same is true with Tommy's story. Uh, there have there's been one of, there have been several books that include Tommy. There's been one about Tommy's work, um, but I do feel that that so much of what Tommy said about his own vision of art and so forth has not been fully captured, and it really needs to be. It, it needs to be part of our records. We need to find that story and put it together, both of those. Um, yeah. Uh, in, in response to uh, the specific questions that Kosia asked, um, on the gender issues, I, I, I should say all three of the questions she asked, I think could be books in themselves, firstly. Um, <laughs> And when I was putting those sections in, in drawn lines, I was sort of, what do I cut out and so forth. But um, in terms of within Medu, how was gender treated? Really, it varied a lot. And, and also, I would say within the political movement, as I, I'm sure, because <laughs> he knows very well. Um, some of the people we worked with, uh, I can mention Tommy was amazing in terms of gender issues. I never felt, ex except for once when he made a comment, right when I first met him along the lines of, um, the, the actual comment was you draw as if you had balls. <laughs> um, and I don't think he had really thought through what the implications of that. I've heard that comment from other people as well. It's very common for women artists to get. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know what to, even to say about it. I, at the time, I just laughed a lot. Um, but there were other people in Meru who had definitely had patriarchal and um, misogynist almost attitudes at times. There were a couple of arguments I had with people and I'm not going to mention names. Um, where, which I felt were, were fairly simply based on they didn't want a woman challenging what they were saying, end of story. And um, the good part about the collective and that I would argue is that we, we at least had space to argue these things through on some level. Um, and if there was a disagreement that seemed to be sexist and so forth, we could discuss that. There is one occasion I do actually describe, I think in the book, when um, Wally asked me to join temporarily the, um, <laughs> the theater unit because that was the one unit that was mostly women at that point. And the four women in the unit had decided to do a, a play called Fresh Footsteps um, which was, they were mostly Botswana women uh, in this group, although they were Botswana women with, um, in some cases, close South African backgrounds as well, so it was mixed. But they were writing about the effect of being Botswana women in a relatively quiet rural area outside Labatsi, I think, is, is where the play is, is set. Um, and trying to deal with the South African revolutionary boyfriends um, and their attitudes towards them as women and how they see their role as wanting to liberate themselves and wanting to live their lives as full people in a situation where everybody sees them as second, second class citizens, even within the liberation movement was very interesting, right? but so I was asked to come and talk about <laughs> gender issues with this group. They were not very happy about my being there, I have to say, on the grounds that they felt my role was to impose some kind of political correctness on this. And that's not what I thought I was trying to do. And in the end, what we said was I would sit and talk with her. I would be with them while they went through finalizing the play, but I didn't actually tell them, you cannot do this or you cannot do that. 
there was one line in there that uh, in the original draft, which was along the lines of, well, maybe we just have to kill all the men. And I think the extent of my comments on that was um, not to say that that line should come out because it was what one of the characters wanted, felt should be said, but that it needed to be at least modified. So that's, I think they left it in and then somebody said, well, maybe we don't have to kill them all immediately or something like that. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but as I said, it was a space to talk about those and at least Medu did provide that space. And there were other occasions when we, when issues of gender came up and we, we really did discuss them. Okay, that was one. Um, as I said, I think that's a whole book in itself. <laughs> um, the second issue she asked was the question of the, how the, those big public things felt living through them. And I, I don't actually, again, that's probably also a book Maybe it's not one that I can write. Um, obviously, a lot of those things still still hurt like hell. Um, there's no peace over something like the death of a child with Katrain. And, um, you know, with adults, you say, pick up the spear, we're going to keep the fighting and so forth. Um, and the fact that you won't speak to that person again is just something you have to live with. Um, and I, again, I think the collective response usually helps somewhat, but it's devastating. It's, and having to live through those things and then having to keep going and they, and they you know, Eventually, you you just uh, you keep going. Um, somebody pointed out after the uh, after the funeral for six of the people who died in the Haparoni raid that it was really important to have a big funeral at which the Botswana government told told me specifically they would not allow us to make posters for that because they were afraid that this might be a first raid and there would be further ones. Um, we did do a banner and I did do the poster, but we didn't mass produce it or distribute it at that time. However, there was a bus that came from um, Silk Screen Training Project in uh, Joburg, um, which was more Smithers and others. And they had printed t-shirts saying Tommy, Tommy Mignelli uh, died in the struggle, revolutionary artist, whatever it was, um, which they were all wearing and which were distributed at the funeral. And it was just, I mean, it was an affirmation that people coming from Joburg who would actually go to jail for that if they were picked up wearing a t-shirt like that could do that. Whereas we in Botswana were being told you couldn't. And, um, and that kind of affirmation makes it much more possible to, for me at least, makes it possible to, to come to terms with those things when they happen. And the other thing I'd like to add to that is, as well as the absolutely god awful things that nothing is ever going to make right, there's also those moments of absolute joy when it really works and everything is fantastic. And I mean, um, with all the subsequent problems, the South African elections had that feeling. Um, I think in the book I talk about dancing in the streets in Johannesburg with Neva. Um, <laughs> just because we had to go to see what, how people responded. It was just great. Anyway, the last one, um, which as I understood the question, Cozy, is 
to talk a little bit about what is the role of art in terms of, of struggle. Um, I think possibly Mandla has talked about that somewhat. Um, again, that one to me is not one book, but a whole series of books. <laughs> and, and there's an, a lot of stuff in the Meru archives which talk directly to that question. And I hope that will be become public. So this is not my own, my own response, but um, I would say very quickly that art is about communication and it's about vision. It, we put together the culture that we've learned and the events we've been through and so forth and try to make those into a statement of some sort. That the vision that we have or what we want to make out of our lives, out of the people around us, and in a bad situation, which well, we're always in a bad situation, <laughs> how we make a bad situation better um, has to be a, a large part of that. Um, and the, the technique, the, the, the skill in terms of making that communication that somebody else could pick it up and get, the, get that sense of it is very, very important. It's critical. Um, I just thought when I was saying that I should give another quote um, from Wally, actually, I think it's in the book also, but was very important to me. Um, <laughs> was when I did an exhibition in Habarani. Afterwards, Wally came up to me and said, you know, I quite like the way you draw, but why are all your people so miserable? You know, if we were all that miserable and we, that's the way we responded to everything around us, we would commit suicide and there wouldn't be a struggle. <laughs> so that was, that to me was one of the very important inputs I got from Medu actually. Um, anyways, um, yeah, and, um, and actually, Dakobe Wamagali Martins, who's another person whose story really needs to be told in terms of the arts, um, in his introduction to the Haberoni conference, says somewhere that um, art will not make a revolution but it can make us understand what we're doing. Or what's, it, it, it doesn't put it quite like that, but it can inspire us and it can make us understand what we need to do and how we do it. And um, I think that that was also a takeaway line for me, for sure. Okay, I'm talking too much. I hope we have time for people to ask questions. Thanks very much, Judy. Um, um, Thank, thank you. Um, I think let's uh, let's see if we can get a couple of rounds of comments and questions from uh, the other participants. If you could put up your hands, um, uh, then I'll call you and you can unmute yourselves and, and start your videos so we can see you. I see Barry Gilder. Um, are there any more hands? I'm trying to see. Not for now. Please feel free to also put any comments, uh, to continue putting comments in the chat or questions for um, Judy, Mandla or Corsi, and I can read them out uh, to them. Uh, uh, Barry, go ahead. Uh, greetings, uh, greetings from Damascus. Um, Sorry, there's a thing that's... Uh, greetings from Damascus. Uh, Ariana. Mandla and Bonch. By the way, I'm doing what's supposed to be done at a book launch. I'm drinking Lebanese wine, which is actually very good. I see the whole of almost, I think the whole of the 
Judy family there, Gay, Katha, Neva, Annie, Samani. Have I left out anybody? Uh, I think Heinz is there with Gay, I'm not sure. Um, and people that, uh, that were an intimate part of our lives, particularly during our time in Botswana. So I don't have questions, Judy, because um, I'm a bit too moved and emotional and I've had a very quick glance at the book um, and not ready to comment substantively. Um, I just want to thank Mandla for mentioning Serge. Serge, as I think Judy knows, was my best friend um, during those days in Botswana and afterwards. Um, and just to say, Judy, that um, I did try to do something on Serge's life after at the end of my time at um, Matla Trust, just after the 94 election, a treatment for a TV script, a TV series based on Serge's life, and they had written a couple of episodes and tried to sell it to the SABC at the time. But uh, they were still, it was still run by the old guard and they weren't interested. And then, of course, I got drafted into the intelligence community and that was the end for a while of my cultural life. Um, so that still needs to be done. Um, I don't know if I can do it now, but that still needs to be done. But thanks so much, Judy, for, for doing this. Um, it's on my next to read reading list. Um, and it will actually help create a writing as I've been communicating with you today as I'm going to use your book as part of my research material. So thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Ariane. Uh, thanks, thanks, Barry. There's a there's a bit about you in the book as well, so uh, you'll get to that eventually. Um, I'm I'm just trying to see if uh, if there's any um, other um, comments. I see there's a um, comment from Maria. Um, let me. I think it's mostly. Um, for Judy, but Mandla may be also able to uh, to respond to some of this. She, Maria uh, Suriano is asking how the posters were conceived. What was the collective um, decision-making process and art-making process? Uh, was Medu loosely affiliated to the ANC? And if so, what was the official ANC approach? And what were the key internal debates about the role of performance art in South African liberation, uh, specifically about how culture shouldn't be used to mobilize international support for the anti-apartheid struggle. Um, and um, I see Maya matches uh, uh, has some questions as well. Let me read them out. Um, uh, it's around the posters and whether there's um, uh, they can be reproduced basically or if there are copyright issues and I'm sure Judy can speak to that. And are you uh, making any new artwork, Judy? I saw a couple of new things as part of the Tree Continental uh, uh, poster exhibitions that they um, have been running. Um, but um, I think if there's no other hands uh, or direct comments, uh, if anyone else would like to speak, I see uh, Kibotlale um, has got a, her hand up. Kibotlale Motsotata, um, she's a student in the history workshop and uh, in the African literature department at WIT. Hi, uh, Ariana. Um, hi, Judy, and hi, everyone. Um, 
sorry, the picture quality is not too good. <laughs> I hope everyone can see me. Um, so my question is direct, it's, it's similar to Maria's um, question on the collective uh, process of making the posters. So Judy, in your book, in page 102, you have a section titled uh, The Collectivist Praxis. And in there, I'm interested in issues of gender as well. And I'm mostly just interested in, in finding out how, so I mean, I'm aware that you were the only woman in the graphics art unit However, the catalog of the Medu posters has a lot of depictions of women. So there's a lot of posters that commemorate uh, important events such as Women's Day. There are a lot of other posters that mobilize everyday women towards the struggle for liberation. There are also just um, sort of other portrayals of women, for example, community women in Botswana. Uh, and so I just wanted to find out how the collective came up with some of these ideas and what influence you also had in this. Um, uh, as much as I'm aware of some of the issues that you raised around gender, the posters also speak to the ways in which the collective was aware of gender issues and how it also tried to incorporate um, the woman question in some of its uh, visual narratives. Um, and the second question is also related to Another question that's also very similar to Maria's, but also very different. I'm interested in inquiring about the tensions which existed, if they did exist, between ANC members and BC members within BC Black Conscious uh, members within Medu structures, if there were any. So I've read an article by Shannon Hill who mentions that. Um, you know, the ANC had little use for culture before Black consciousness identified it as a medium of struggle and that the ANC benefited from the idea that BC was race-centered as opposed to non-racial. So I just want to find out how, what collaborative efforts existed between ANC members and BC members when, uh, you know, Medu um, as a structure came together and whether or not these tensions did exist because uh, you know, some members of Medu were affiliated to the ANC and some were from a Black consciousness background. And so I'm just interested in some of those discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Kivo. Um, Kivo Trale is uh, doing her MA research on uh, Medu's posters. You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> um, Hence, a very specific questions, but um, I don't see any more questions, uh, any more hands. Sorry, I know uh, a lot of uh, uh, quite a lot has been asked already. So um, let me. It's already quarter to uh, seven now. So let me just give you a chance to respond, and you may want to choose what you uh, what you want to respond to, uh, given it's quite a lot. Um, and I'll then, uh, Judy, uh, uh, give Mandla and uh, Kosi also an opportunity to make any uh, final comments. I think we should try to come to a close fairly soon. Ariana, sorry, if I can come in, Ariana. Up, hi there, hi. Hi, hi Lee. <laughs> I posted a question in the chat. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Oh, and it would be see. great if Judy can speak just very briefly to it. I'd, I'd really like that, yeah. It doesn't require a long answer, so yeah, yeah. Or long response. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to know. <laughs> yeah. um, Lee is asking, um, uh, um about uh, 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 naming the comrade who shall not be named in your book uh, referring to the tea episode um and whether after all these years uh, uh, that comrade could in fact be named but um i'll leave it's in the chat judy um uh, okay um i'll I'll leave it to you to respond to some of these uh, okay. uh, comments and questions. It's uh, really quite a lot, uh, so up to you. And then um, I'll, we'll go back to Mandla and Kosi. Okay, so, so very quickly then, um, I'll try to be quick. 
uh, collective decisions, uh, how the posters were conceived, it varied a lot. Usually we decided that there, as a, as a group, that there was something that needed to be commemorated or to be um, uh, publicized one way or the other. And um, we would talk about what that event and what it was. And then we had different ways to decide who would do what. Sometimes it was just given to one person and it was you do it. We tried a couple of times asking several people to come up with different sketches. And then we talked about those sketches and how those worked or didn't work. Um, so other times, um, somebody would come up with an idea that they thought was going to work and they would do a, essentially a poster design and present it to the group and say, I think this is what we should do. And again, there would be some discussion. Did it actually get all the issues? Was it, were the words right? Were the, you know, colors right? All of those things. Um, they were very intense discussions and actually incredibly interesting in terms of artistic, um, perception. And one of the things I, I would like to say came out of Medu was that this conception that, that political art is crushing the artistic spirit is completely opposite to what certainly I felt the Medu experience usually was. I mean, I, I don't think there was ever an occasion when I felt that people came in and said, you can't do that poster because it's politically incorrect. Um, the, co the collective thing was a, a work in progress. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it worked better than others. <laughs> um, but I can uh, go into lots more detail, but I think there's probably not time for it here if you want more. Um, in terms of Meta's affiliations to the ANC, um, firstly, it depends on when you talk about it. This also talks to the question raised um, about, uh, about BC and, and the ANC. Uh, the initial group of people who set up a cultural collective in Botswana were mostly BC. Um, some of them became ANC members. I mean, both Wally and Tommy had BC connections. There was also not that sort of obvious break between BC and ANC until 70, well, into, until the time after Biko's death, really, um, as, I understand, as I read it, uh, and other people can correct me, I hope I'm. Um, I was not in Botswana and in Meru at the time. Mandla, I don't know if you were there some of that time as well, and maybe you could comment on that, but there was a split between BC and ANC within Meru just before I got there in mid-79. And it was specifically around the question of whether whites would be allowed to be full members. There were whites who worked with Meru, but they were seen as teachers or defined as, or, or assisted. They assisted with technical stuff. They weren't part of the actual cultural um, group in the, in, the, in the fundamental way. So after the split, it, it was clear that, um, Medu was much more closely aligned with ANC in terms of Botswana regulations and in terms of just safety. Nobody was going to say that publicly. Um, <laughs> I think Bachana Makweda once stood up at a meeting and said, nobody in this organization has a, has a party code for anything, <laughs> not even for Medu. <laughs> um, uh, and I mean, that was years before the raid actually happened, but it was clear that Medic was potentially a target, so nobody was going to say so. Um, there was very conscious, many of the, many of the Medu members, certainly from 19, late 79, were ANC activists and they saw their art as aligned with the movement and they worked with the movement on developing a theory and a practice of it. Um, and you could say some people have said that it was an ANC organization at that point. I, I think it's much more subtle than that personally. I, I, I would like to argue that, but it's, it's certainly for debate. And 
I would like to see that. That's another thing I would like to see much better recorded at the moment. Our records are not that good. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention, and this also speaks to the question about uh, performing notes. Um, so Jonas Guangkwa was one of the founder members of Medu, for, right from 77, 78. He was in and out. He was also working in the States, but he was coming back to Botswana. And starting from late 79, I think, he was also in Angola setting up Mandla, uh, a Mandla cultural ensemble. Um, there is a book about Jonas's life that is due to come out sometime soon. I hope Gwen is one of the people working as an editor on it. So uh, hopefully there will be much more information about that as it comes out. But people like Jonas undoubtedly saw that art was part of the cultural, of the cultural liberation movement and Medu was part of that. And there was no question if you were going to put your heart into the, into the cultural struggle, you had to be aligned with the people's party, which well, it wasn't a party at that time, <laughs> people's movement. And um, it was expected that you would see yourself as working with the ANC. And furthermore, there was a big question about working with MK as well, because many of the many of the Medu members were also working with MK, which of course we never discussed in Medu and <laughs> was not public. <laughs> um, but I should also say people like Tommy Mignelli deserve to have the fact that they were MK members and working with MK throughout known publicly. I personally, I feel that strongly. There is no reason not to publicize that at this point. And Mandla, I hope you'll talk about that too. Um, uh, Do we have time? Uh, oh, and quickly, he who will not be named, I think I should name him. Um, he is a, he's a comrade I have respect for in many ways. <laughs> I, it was one of the times I did that. <laughs> um, and I don't feel if other, if other women felt that he consistently made it difficult for women, I think that ought to be said, but I'm not sure that that was all that regular. I think, I felt at the time this was a, <laughs> this, this was a, a not thought through the, the T incident was something that that person really thought that, that this is the way it ought to be, and he hadn't. He hadn't even thought about it. <laughs> yeah, that's. Um, Judy, I might ask you to to just come back quickly to some of your current work, but uh, I'd oh, like current work. <laughs> first, uh, let me let me first uh, ask Mandla and Kosi um uh, to come in with uh, any any uh, responses to what's been raised or any final comments and then you can have the last uh, uh, the last word and perhaps tell us a bit about your new work mandla would you like to come in Very next briefly, yes. i would just like to say uh, that the genesis of medu medu, medu started as a group of uh, South African exiles who came from all sorts of formations and who uh, started as Pelandaba cultural effort. Uh, and then that morphed into Medu. But uh, in 1977, I was part of the group that went with Gwangwa to Nigeria, where we saw performances and that was a time when Amandla Cultural Ensemble, or the beginning of the seed that became Amandla Cultural Ensemble was formed or came about. Then we came back to Botswana. Wally and I, we then started to talk about the making made some kind of formation a lot more concrete than what it was. And that's when Medu uh, came into being. 
I remember I was uh, the editor of Medu's magazine and the word Medu was taken from Sipedi. Uh, we looked for a language that was a minority language from South Africa to make sure that it does not become one of those uh, either Zulu, Tosa, or, or, or Tswana. Having said all that, uh, the decision making in Medu was, of course, very, very democratic. People argued there sometimes to the point of almost trading blows, but it was a comradely uh, argue, arguing. And the dichotomy, the BC and ANC, it, I would say it was a, a situation where there was a growing consciousness of the understanding that the ANC was the most preeminent formation. And uh, in 1979, I remember, it was the centenary of Isandlwan. We created a play there, a Marumo, and we took the traditions from within South Africa itself and the traditions from Botswana to create uh, something that would celebrate uh, the centenary, but at the same time, speak of the armed struggle that was currently ongoing and so on, the same thing with shades of change and so on and so forth. So I think it would be a mistake to speak of a, uh, a machination uh, at work. I think the ANC got wise to, me, to Medu by the by. It was not its, uh, how do you call this? Its strategic formation, not by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, the strength was, was mostly with BC. But then as time went, there was that gravitational, how to say this pool of the ANC towards, uh, or of Medu from BC into the ANC. For instance, our going to Nigeria, although we were BC, was sponsored by the ANC, Keith Mukwape and, uh, and so on and so forth. So, it's a long story, I think. It can't just be told uh, in, uh, in, 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 in a few paragraphs. We need, we need to sit down and talk about it in a much more comprehensive way. Thank you. Thank you, Mandla. Um, Kosi, over to you um, for any final comments uh, or remarks. Well, my final comments go to you, Ariana, and your department, because I think it's very important that projects like this book get a lot more institutional support, because if Judy's responses to my questions are, that question deserves a book, that is another book. That is another book. <laughs> how many more stories are out there that we know need to be told, but mm -hmm. how many Judies are out there who can put their books together and self-publish them? Last year, this book came out, Malibongwe, which is a book of poems by women in the struggle. It was edited by Lindwe Mabuza. It took an institution, somebody who's based at Stellenbosch, Uhuru Palafala, to pioneer and do the work and approach the editor to make the book come about, which has a lovely story. I mean, how many books do we know of that were translated into Danish, Dutch, Finnish, Swedish, Norwegian, Russian, before they came to South Africa? It's taken this book 40 years to be available in South Africa. But it was through some institutional support with money that made it possible. So I suppose my last comments are to say that it excites me that this is beginning to happen. 
I think the big challenge will lie with institutions like this history workshop, whose interest is history, who can make it happen because there are a lot of stories that needs to be told. When Judy and I met in preparation for this panel, she said, well, I wrote the book because it was important for me. I needed to tell my story, but people have died. A lot of the other people have died. So people are gonna be dying. And in no time, there'll be nobody who remembers the story. There'll be nobody who was participating there. And I think Ariana and your unit, institutions in South Africa, you have a challenge. And I think you need to just grab it. And for me, it's exciting that it's starting to happen. <laughs> Thank you, Cozy. Um, as Judy mentioned um, at the beginning, uh, we are trying to, uh, as a next uh, uh, thing to do, uh, as a challenge for us to uh, begin the process of archive, digitizing and archiving um, the work of Medu and, and putting it in the, in the public domain. So uh, this is uh, the history workshop as well as uh, through the help of uh, archives such as its historical papers and South African history archive, which already has a large collection of posters, including um, a, a lot of uh, material on Medu. So um, yeah, definitely we are taking um, up the challenge, Kosi. Um, Judy, I'll leave it to you to say any final words um, so that we can close after that. I just want to remind everyone, especially those that joined the meeting later, that Judy's book has been self-published. Um, it's available um, at Love Books Bookshop in Melville, uh, in Johannesburg, or uh, you can buy a copy um, uh, uh, through the internet uh, and have it posted it within South Africa. Judy uh, posted the, the details of this at the beginning of the chat, so please have a look there for the details. Um, Judy, I'll leave it to you to say any final words. Thanks very much uh, to, to everyone for participating and thanks in particular to uh, Mandla Langa and Marco Sazana Maba for uh, their, their precious input. Um, it's been uh, very nice uh, to, to do this for us uh, as the history workshop. Uh, we've been uh, working with Judy for a number of years now, uh, including uh, on the exhibition that she did at Museum Africa um, at the end of 2019 and hope to continue to work with her uh, in the years to come. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, okay, so I, I promised I would do, I said I would do a quick answer to those two questions about um, it, it was current work and about copyright access for the Medu works. Um, all of the Medu posters have been put under Creative Commons, which means they're free to reproduce for educational, et cetera, purposes. Um, if you're planning to make money off them, then you should try and get in touch with um, who's ever got copyright, well, who's ever would be the inheritors of but that's such a complicated question. I don't even know how you would begin to do it. But for certainly for educational or for cultural purposes, we would want them reproduced. So, um, and uh, yeah. Um, in terms of current work, I'm still trying. <laughs> I've been doing some work recently with a series of exhibitions by the Tricontinental Institute, which was really exciting to have people ask what's happened to progressive cultural issues around imperialism and so forth in the last decade or so um, with artists around the world. So that's been an, an interesting and exciting experience and I'd, I'd like to thank them. And if anybody's interested, um, that website that's on, on that's selling the book has also got those recent pictures in it for my mind. <laughs> so, yeah. Other than that, I guess I would just like to say thank you so much 
for all the <laughs> for, for all the participation for the comments people have made um, raising these issues um, cozy your point your most recent the last point that we need to get this institutionalized I just want to add to it and we need to make sure that the Department of Arts and Culture, which has some resources for this kind of stuff, uses it for this. And uh, they, they haven't to date. There's been no support at all for archiving this or for getting it into the public domain, um, with the exception of some work that's been done by Freedom Park. But there's been no dedicated um, efforts to put this together. And it must be. And I think that's something we all face. And, and thank you, Ariana and History Workshop for, for your support. <laughs> and, and thank you all comrades, friends and family, as I said, it's been great, thank you. Thanks, Judy. Um, I, I don't know if that's a hand from, from Gay, if you want to come in quickly. I just want Judy to answer the question about the tea episode. <laughs> the tea incident. Um, maybe I have to say what the tea incident was in that case, which yeah. was that at the time of the uh, Culture and Resistance Festival, um, there was a meeting just before it in which the comrade who shall not be named um, <laughs> basically said, oops, we forgot to put into the budget um, money to pay for tea. Uh, to pay for people to serve the teas. I mean, there was money for the tea, but as opposed to meals, which were being run by the university. So um, he was suggesting that the women in Meru then start, uh, would um, serve the teas, which meant that we would have to leave the discussions an hour before and probably half an hour afterwards to get that done. <laughs> and... Um, I said no, <laughs> and I didn't think that was really an acceptable arrangement. If Meru members were going to do it, we had to all of us work on this. And clearly, he who shall not be named did not think that was something he was willing to accept. He then attacked me on the grounds that if you look at pictures of the Freedom Charter and so forth, it's always the women cooking the food. I mean, why can't we have women in Meru? <laughs> making the tea and um, we didn't solve it at that meeting I went around and spoke to the other women in Medu and came up with a collective agreement that we said no <laughs> and the next day there was another meeting and um, uh, the comrade in question came in and said well okay We've discussed it and we think we can find enough money in the budget to hire the employees from the university uh, catering staff to do the teas as well. And that was the end of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Gay, if you want, I'll tell you who it was, but not, I'm not doing it publicly. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's uh, it's ten past, so I think we should close here. Um, Mandla um, had asked where where the party is going to be, um, <laughs> so I guess the party will have a party when we launch the Medu archives and when this uh, with damn COVID is over. <laughs> and, and we I'm hope we sure. will all see you there in person. Yes, uh, with hugs. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, uh, thanks everyone for participating. There was a, there were a lot of comments in the chat, Judy. Um, I yeah. hope uh, that Laura um, can capture those. I don't know if they can be mm -hmm. saved. Um, uh, if they can, please, Laura, save them for us. And uh, thanks, thanks very much. Thanks to Judy. Thanks to Mandla and Kosi and. Uh, um, this is it uh, for, for tonight. Okay, Laura is gonna save uh, the comments for you, Judy, and we'll post okay. the recordings on uh, the recording of the launch online so that it can be shared. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Feel, bye -bye. feel free to unmute and say goodbye. Uh, <laughs> bye, yeah. everybody. It was great. Thank you. And we can have that party in Damascus, by the way. It's great. Yeah. <laughs>
COVID permitting. No, we don't worry about COVID in the <laughs> No, it's a transport that's not permitting. It's dropping missiles on us. COVID is nothing. Ariane, can I just make a suggestion for the VITS workshop, for the history workshop? You know, I actually think expecting lots of people to write biographies is a lot. But if you guys, I've been telling Judy this for years, you guys should be doing video interviews. Like you should be doing 